So I think what we'd like to do today, folks, is walk through a little bit of the macro and what we're seeing out there within the investment community. Mohan's going to chat briefly about how we plan to allocate our capital here over the next while. And then that will follow with Terry talking a bit about WeMe, which is obviously one of our, our larger investments. And, and we'll wrap that up with Jim at the end just to talk about the, the portfolio. So as we look at what's happening in 2022, it's, it's really starting to feel very much like 2008. Um, you're seeing a lot of volatility out there. You're seeing a variety of different macro issues that are hitting investors. Um, and, and you've seen a real sharp drop off in valuations, both in the equity bond markets, physicals, cryptos across the board. And it, it's a pretty serious pull of liquidity out of the environment. The, the notable difference that we're seeing here is the the central banks around the world back in 2008 put a lot of sort of things in place to maintain the liquidity within the system. So in 2008, we saw really short term investment vehicles like repos and other things just basically freeze up. What we're seeing now is that's continuing to go. So we're not so concerned about a black swan event or something you know substantial uh, other than just a consistent sell down now if we look at what we're seeing out there from i guess we'll call it the media and the big kind of macro issues the biggest one we're seeing and probably what all of our investors are hearing about on a daily basis is inflation we're starting to think that inflation probably peaked back in uh, in june uh, maybe even sooner uh, the reason we're thinking that is, is a variety of different items. The first being the, the sort of physical commodities that you see out there. So generally investors look to the three C's, whether it's sort of referring to crude, copper, and corn. All of them are down dramatically in the last 30 days. And in fact, you're seeing copper trading around the, the 2008 level almost, which was sort of pre kind of right around the Lehman crash time. That's on the macro. As we look a little bit tighter into the inflation environment, or sorry, interest rate environment, you're seeing central banks across the board raising rates aggressively. We've seen the yield curve go inverted today. Basically, what that means is the business community, the investor community is starting to think that potentially the, the central bank actions are probably too aggressive. And we wouldn't be surprised to see those uh, almost flip or, or lessen dramatically as we come into the end of the year. Lastly, you've got the consumer. They face COVID. They're facing high gas prices. They're facing home prices going down. The consumer is not going to continue to drive inflation here. And if anything, we're probably going to going to see them pull back farther. What that means from an equity basis is with the initial sell down we've seen, we've seen multiples pull back pretty well. The next shoe to drop is probably going to be uh, an earnings revisions across the board. Um, these companies are facing headwinds in, in all directions, and, and you're going to see a lot of choppy trading around that. You saw it after the close today with a, a large technology company called Snap with uh, with their numbers down 25 or down dramatically and the stock trading down 25 percent of the day. So it's going to take a little time, but that inflation trade is, is definitely lessening and, and it's going to become less of an issue. The other Really serious issue that we're facing, obviously, is on the geopolitical side with the, uh, the Ukrainian Russian war. We've sort of reaching a point here where we believe that uh, the two main backers, the United States and Europe, are probably going to be facing a lot of pressures uh, within the United States. They've got midterm elections coming up in November. The expectation is that, that the Republicans are going to take both the House and the Senate. That's going to be a big pullback as they've uh, already signaled that they don't want to continue this sort of uh, significant funding of the war. Then as you look to Europe, who've also been a big supporter, you know, general countries have big problems in terms of just sort of feeding and clothing their population right now and keeping them warm. That's going to put a lot of pressure on policymakers and push for some sort of resolution, which at the same time, the ECB, while raising rates today, is faced with a, a dichotomy within their community with some of their countries, such as Italy and Spain, being very debt laden. So they can't continue to uh, can't continue to push um, rates higher, as you can probably see in the United States. So, so we expect to see a lot of people pushing very aggressively 
um, for some sort of resolution there. And obviously that would be a, a massive positive for the market. And then lastly, we're starting to see some of the results of, I, I would call them green policies, both within the, the food and energy side. On the food side, there's been a lot of pressure on developing countries out there to eliminate fertilizers. These policies clearly don't work. We're seeing the results now in, uh, in Sri Lanka as there's been a, a replacement of the government. We're starting to see that happen uh, today and a couple of days before in Ecuador and within the Netherlands as well. You're starting to see a lot of pushback. And then as you look to it on the energy side, a lot of money has been spent, especially in Germany, over $500 billion on green solutions to things. They really only managed to take about 5 or 6% of the grid off hydrocarbons. It's unlikely that these policies are going to be sustainable in what's becoming a, a pretty quickly capital-constrained environment. Uh, you'll see lots of uh, coal coming back online. You'll see nuclear coming back online. Again, this will help in general with the inflation and getting things back to normal. Um, but I think the, the bigger thing you're going to see, and, and you've already seen it, is, is governments that are putting these policies in place, um, they're getting removed. So whether they're getting removed through elections that you're going to see with the Democrats and so with Marcon in France, you're seeing it through political dialogue with Boris Johnson in the UK, now you've got Draghi in Italy. And then more importantly, and probably a little bit scary, is you're starting to see it with just good old fashioned revolutions in Sri Lanka, looks like Ecuador is following. So I think today's average person is more focused on the economic realities and just common sense policies. So we think you're gonna to continue to see that transition and while it's playing it in the media, you're gonna to start to see probably less dollars going in there to a certain extent. So as a general perspective, we're expecting to see a lot of short cycles over the next two quarters. It's gonna be highlighted by macro events and lots of volatility. Thankfully, we're pretty well positioned. We've upped our cash position to, to $6 million. And you know, we're feeling pretty comfortable about that. We've seen a decline of equities of about 35% in general bear markets. We're down about 20% now. So, we're starting to think it's it's good to become a little bit more proactive and selective as we we pick away at, at good names out there. Um, I think now would probably be a good way good time to to segue to Mohan. He's going to talk a little bit about how we're going to deploy that capital and the strategies we're going to use to to really operate and keep our liquidity in what is going to be a, a continued challenging environment over the next uh, two quarters. Uh, I'll start by talking about some of the sectors we'll be targeting going forward, which is on the slide you see there. You know, our historical mandate of only investing in cannabis and, and mostly through private equity placements had severely limited our growth. You know, as that industry, as Mike mentioned, has been in a secular decline over the last several years. Uh, despite that, though, our stock and our net tangible asset values have actually outperformed uh, most of the broader cannabis indices and ETFs. So we're pretty happy and proud about that, but ultimately absolute returns are more important than just outperforming the sector. Uh, so we're grateful to the shareholders, to you all, uh, for approving a broadening of our mandate uh, to diversify out of cannabis this year. Uh, this move finally gave us the ability to, to diversify to high growth sectors, high growth vest, and aggressively look for uh, liquidity from some of our existing cannabis portfolio. You know, as a case in point, and you may have seen it on Mike's slide, uh, we recently negotiated an exit uh, from our Entourage Health convertible note position at nearly a 60% premium to where those notes were trading in the public market. And that generated significant capital for us to make some of these new investments. And we're working hard to generate similar outcomes for our other cannabis portfolio holdings. Uh, we're aiming to exit most of our cannabis investments over, call it the next 12 to, to 16 months, uh, with some specific exceptions like which weed me, which um, I'll get to later. But sort of, we would caution that, you know, control positions and private company status for some of the names can be a, a mediating factor in how fast we can accomplish this. Uh, but the goal remains over the next 12 to, to 16 months. In either case, uh, as and when we get liquidity uh, from most of the remaining cannabis names, we're channeling those proceeds into the following sectors that you see on the slide, technology, healthcare, 
consumer discretionary commodities and, and, and you know, others on a selective basis. To be clear though, we won't be completely exiting cannabis. It's just that cannabis will become a much smaller part of the portfolio. We'll only hold on to best of, breeds com best of breed companies like Weedme, who you'll see later on uh, in that sector. So why do we pick these sectors, right? Uh, so tech, healthcare, and consumer discretionary have on average been the best performing sectors annually on the S&P 500 for the last 20 years. So focusing on these sectors keeps our aim for high growth opportunities intact, right? Commodities uh, are not as consistent in terms of returns as the other three because uh, of their inherently cyclical nature. Uh, however, there can be tremendous upside during an upcycle, you know, where small and micro cap names become mid cap and large cap names uh, just due to the performance of the underlying commodity, right? So we're selectively looking at commodities as well. And we'll also look at other sectors. We'll look at things like ESG, uh, you know, which have a lot of regulatory and social tailwinds behind them. But again, we'll be more selective there. Really where we wanna be is in information technology, healthcare and consumer discretionary, and then everyone else on a selective basis. Uh, next slide, please. So while targeting the right business sectors to invest in uh, is crucial for setting return expectations, the method and structure of the investment is just as important a decision to make, right? We wanna invest in our target business sectors but through using a basket of uncorrelated and partially hedged strategies, including, uh, as you see on the list, warrant isolation, merger arbitrage, sector long short, running quantitative screens, uh, looking at capital structure arbitrage opportunities, in addition to making private investments. Historically, we could only do privates and some public long only investments in the cannabis space. So going forward, uh, the diversity in sectors and strategies uh, will create a portfolio with more with a more call it a more consistent return characteristic uh, rather than our historical legacy portfolio, which was highly levered to just one strategy, which was long only, and one sector, which was cannabis. And so like our liquidity efforts that I was talking about and Mike mentioned as well, we've already begun this transition and we'll deploy more money into these strategies and sectors as the capital becomes uh, available. Uh, next slide, please. So having said all that about, you know, the, the future investing in new sectors, uh, new strategies, uh, I do want to say that we want to be very responsible and thoughtful in how we transition out of cannabis. You know, we don't want to just carelessly divest assets when they may be experiencing uh, a cyclical low, only to regret that sale a few months later, you know. While we're aggressively looking to exit some positions, we're not looking for quick sales, right? A price is, is very important to us still. Uh, this is particularly important because the underlying businesses in our portfolio are actually much stronger than where they were a few years ago, right? Many of the companies, and I think Mike touched on this, many of the companies now have steady growing sales, cash burn rates are much lower, uh, management teams are far more focused on core business execution. You know, in the, in the past, management teams in cannabis would spend time on M&A and new business lines and all these other things because the capital markets allowed them to do so. And we saw that particularly in publicly listed companies, uh, not as much in private companies, although you saw a little bit of it. And what you've sort of seen over the last three years is actually a significant outperformance by some of the private companies, including some of the ones that we own versus where the, the public market uh, comps sort of trade. So sort of going off that, I want to call your attention uh, to the collapse in the publicly traded cannabis names, which were, they were trading at 4.2 times, as you see on that uh, slide there, at the beginning of the year, and now they're at like 1.9 times. These are revenue multiples I'm talking about. So, you know, cannabis had already gotten hit the year before or the, or the last, you know, two years. And then for there to be this further decline over the last six months, I mean, this type of sell-off is typical in a capitulation phase of an industry cycle. Uh, we've seen it in other sectors like tech, housing, commodities. So we don't want to be conducting quick sales at the capitulation lows especially when the companies themselves are performing so much better. So it would sort of like be, it would be like selling oil and gas stocks in 2018 after having held them through, uh, you know, the crash from the peak in, in, in 2012 and 2014. It would be like selling tech companies in uh, 2004 after having lived through the crash of 2001, 2002, and 2003. Or like selling U.S. financials and housing in 2011 after having suffered through 08, 09, and 10. So we don't want to carelessly dispose of assets uh, you know, at what are likely to be historical low multiples, we, we have to be more strategic and, and thoughtful like we were with uh, Weed Me uh, and negotiate attractive uh, terms for our exit. And so that sort of leads me to another point. 
which is that ironically, as we base our company valuations off public market comps, we've had to mark down our portfolio despite what are actually strengthening fundamentals at the company level, right? And so that's that's something to think about. Uh, so I, mean, I guess in summary, what I'd say is we're committed to transitioning out of cannabis and into higher growth sectors and diversified investment strategies. And that's the, the plan for the next 12 to 16 months, absolutely. But we'll always be thoughtful about the manner in which we do that in order to maximize shareholder return for you. And that brings me to WeedMe, uh, which is our largest portfolio holding and most embodies the dichotomy that we've been talking about between public company valuations and private company you know, performance. WeedMe is a textbook example of a company that has used the market downturn to dominate against larger competitors and seize market share. They've become a market leader in the space. Uh, Terry will tell you more details. I, I think it's probably top three in, in Canada now. Uh, through innovative products, execution on production and logistics, and just sheer hard work and belief in themselves and their products. And we're, we're very proud to, to be an investor in them and to support them. And so what I'll summarize with is saying that, you know, our target sector composition and our strategy going forward will mean that cannabis is a much smaller part of the portfolio. No question about that. We will be far more diversified. But there will always be a place for incredible stories like uh, like WeedMe. And so with that, I'd like to pass it over to Terry from WeedMe, uh, tell you more about his uh, his company, his story. Take it away, Terry. So just start off with, uh, I'm Terry Glaga. I'm the founder and CEO of WeedMe. Um, Hygrovest uh, has always been supportive of us. They were our original seed investor way back in the beginning. And uh, with your support, it was definitely a integral part of our success. So uh, your support has been appreciated. I'm going to go through our investor presentation. Uh, it will give you a lot of color as to what we do and how we do things. And uh, I hope that you find it informative. If we could uh, start flipping through the slides, please, Adrian. Let's go to the next one. So our vision, our weed me is, you know, go back one slide, please. Our vision is to become the most recognized cannabis brand in the world to enhance people's lives, body and spirit and our mission is to be a brand that's synonymous with quality and value in a socially conscious, inclusive environment. Uh, I think we've been very successful doing that. Um, it's always been about simple teamwork, uh, quality products, and, and remaining innovative at all times. Uh, next slide, Adrian. So myself and Benny Pressman started this company back in 2016. Um, we, we are a federally licensed cannabis company. Uh, we do, uh, cultivate products, but we also curate products in a large way. We are one of Canada's largest buyers of products now. And through that, we're able to curate the highest quality products in the marketplace. And we also employ quite a few people. We've got over 200 people at the facility on a daily basis. And we are an all-inclusive uh, working environment that does not discriminate against anyone. And we have quite a colorful team. Uh, the team is really what makes us shine. We have people that have been with us since the beginning and we just continue growing. Uh, the motto at WeedMe is it has to be great. And we really stick to that motto for all of our products. And that's where we get the uh, brand recognition and the consumers coming back over and over again. Next slide. Here are some snapshots of, of what WeedMe has accomplished. Um, we've had over $130 million of retail consumer dollars spent on our products, uh, over 10 million pre-rolls sold, over half a million vapes sold. We currently have access to over 37 million uh, people uh, in, the pro in the territories that we sell in, over 200 plus SKUs across four product categories, uh, over 5 million individual branded products sold. Uh, we just finished our sixth quarter of being EBITDA positive, um, and we're the second highest selling uh, brand for pre-rolls in Canada, exclusive of Quebec. If you include Quebec, we would be the third highest selling. Quebec is a territory that we're just entering into now in the upcoming quarter. Um, we do have access to over 3,100 stores. And we have a high focus in the convenience category. So that's pre-rolls and vapes. And we're the fourth highest selling brand in Canada uh, across that category. Next slide. Here's a graph of the consumer retail dollars spent on our products. Um, you can see uh, continuous growth uh, right up until the last month. Uh, consumer awareness of the WeedMe brand continues to expand. 
Uh, we are uh, entering into new market segments now, and we do have a strategy to uh, continue our growth in a large way. Um, through our product demand, uh, we've had over $91 million of uh, branded product has been sold in the last 12 months. Uh, next slide. So our distribution spans through the majority of, uh, of Canada, through the most populous provinces uh, for sure. Um, and also on the right, uh, you'll see a sort of a network of growers through this a visual representation. Uh, we, we have access to hundreds of growers. We work predominantly with about 50 of them uh, currently. And this is uh, where we source the majority of the products we sell. Uh, it's through curating our products that we're able to innovate continually, and we're also able to uh, ensure the highest quality standards of our products. The, the fact of the matter is that when a product arrives at our door, if it doesn't meet spec, we don't accept it. So we're never in a position where we're stuck to sell whatever products we happen to have cultivated, which is one of the pitfalls of many large scale cultivators producing substandard products and, and then being uh, hooped to try and sell it. Next slide. Here's a snapshot to give a bit of color as to the products we sell. Uh, we won't go into too much detail, but this is some of the flower products we sell in packages. You can see that there's a tremendous variety down the left side. And then on the right side, you can see in which provinces we're selling these SKUs. Next slide. The following is the higher quality product of Weed Me Limited Batch, which is sold in jars. This is all three and a half gram packages sold in various provinces. Uh, next slide. Here's some of our pre-roll products. These include uh, so, uh, some variety packs. We've started to do a, a number of different formats. So here we have some value packages in terms of 10.35 gram joints. We have uh, six half gram joints that are a variety of joints in a package, which is very popular. And we have larger one gram joints. If you go to the next um, slide, here we've got a list of what we started with was three half gram joints in a tube. This was our, our bread and butter. We've been selling this for years. A very, very popular product. You can see that nearly all of them are listed in, in quite a few of the provinces. The pre-rolls make up uh, about 65 to 70% of our revenues. Uh, we do sell them in a big way and we're on track to be the largest pre-roll brand in Canada. Um, the lower part of the slide here shows some, some newer products, infused pre-rolls that we sell. So these are pre-rolls that are infused with um, items like THC diamonds or, or distillate or keef or hash and uh, everything under the sun to, to make them more potent. Um, next slide. The 2.0 category uh, consists of gummies, vapes, uh, and chocolates. Uh, we, we do sell these. Again, you can see through here, one of the newest launches we're doing is uh, chocolate truffles. Uh, it's, it's a very, very popular product uh, that's being transitioned into the, into the current uh, market that we're selling into. Um, the vape category as well, we sell one format, the 510 threaded cart, which is all one gram vapes. And we've recently moved into a 1.2 gram as well uh, launch. As you can see here, it's only in Alberta. We've always been very selective with how we launch products. Um, and then uh, we gauge what the demand is going to be. If it turns out to be a popular product, we will start pushing it coast to coast very rapidly. Um, and, and conversely, if we find that a, a product's a poor performer, or, or the consumer is getting tired of the same product, we quickly swap it out to maintain the velocity of our sales. Next slide. So the grind products, uh, Weed Me Grind is a, a sub brand that we've created. It's more of a value brand. Here you have milled product. Uh, it, it effectively is in two buckets, either sativa or indica. Um, it comes in a few variations, 20% uh, THC or higher, 30% THC or higher, as well as higher volume packages of, of pre-rolls. So there's 10.35 gram joints and there's also 20.4 gram joints. Um, these listings and SKUs have become very, very popular in the uh, territories that we're selling them and are quickly becoming some of the best sellers 
um, we're able to significantly leverage the product that we're selling because these these uh, SKUs are not specific to any one strain. So we can be very opportunistic with the product that we acquire, increasing our margins. Uh, next slide. So for opportunities for growth through the success of WeedMe uh, through 2021, the entirety of our sales were WeedMe branded product. Uh, we took a step back and looked at our portfolio and our brand image, and we identified a few opportunities for us to further continue our rapid growth. Um, they were gimmick branding, uh, French language focused branding for the Quebec region, uh, ultra luxury product for enthusiasts, uh, social initiative and environmental impact, as well as CBD focused health and wellness products. Um, what we did was uh, we decided to fill these gaps in various ways. Some of them, we organically created new brands uh, in-house, and some of them we acquired brands uh, most recently of previous brands that have been selling in the marketplace that just happened to fit ideally these niches uh, that we found that we could find that we could grow into uh, very rapidly. Let's go to the next slide. So for gimmick branding, we launched a, a, a new brand called Babysitter. Uh, these products have started selling in Alberta in June, and they'll be going into Ontario in the fall. Uh, this is focused, these products are focused more for a, a consumer that's new to cannabis to some degree and, and just wants to have a fun time, and they can be quite influenced by the bud tenders that are selling the products. The products themselves range from high THC products to CBD products to blended products. Uh, as an example, Spa Day on the uh, second from the left is a CBD product, a uh, very, very uh, fitting product to take to the spa and utilize there. You'll be extremely relaxed without having a psychoactive effect and a very sort of complementary to the experience in a spa that one would have. Um, we'll go to the next slide. For the French language focus brand, we've created Claire de Lune. Um, this brand has been accepted into Quebec. It will be launching uh, October on the outside. Some of our POs are for as early as August into September. We have 24 SKUs launching there under Claire de Lune, and a handful of Weed Me SKUs have been accepted into that region as well. There's about a, a population of 8 million people there. Uh, the interesting thing about that region is that there's fewer than 25 producers selling into that region. So it's a very competitive landscape to get into, but not as competitive once you're inside of it. Uh, to put that into context, there's four to 500 producers selling into Ontario or BC and other comparable provinces. Um, let's go to the next slide. For the ultra luxury product enthusiast, uh, Wink is a brand that we acquired uh, recently. This brand has been selling for the last few years. It, it does have a, a brand recognition with the ultra premium enthusiast. Uh, the slogan for this product is premium, ultra premium weed for those who know. And, and the idea behind that is that it provides information about the product itself, the breeder, the strain, the lineage, the uh, C of A, which is the certificate of authenticity, the terpene profile. It truly gives a lot of information behind the product. Um, a lot of it's available on the website. So when people get, get the product, they can do a little bit of research and really find out a lot more in, uh, information about the product. Um, these are high-end uh, ultra luxury premium products at a higher price point. The margins are, are quite reasonable. Um, the product that we source here are from uh, extremely uh, well uh, educated growers that are very, very experienced with what they grow. So uh, truly uh, as uh, hands above any other competitors that are selling similar products in the marketplace. Um, next slide. For social initiative and environmental impact, we acquired the, th the Thumbs Up brand. The slogan is feel good and save the planet. Um, the packaging of these products is uh, recycled, biodegradable packaging materials, um, as well as there is a social initiative for reforestation for the products sold. So there's a component of the revenues that goes towards planting trees uh, through Canada. And, and this, this product, uh, again, has been selling in the marketplace for the last few years. 
uh, very, very uh, complementary in terms of what we'd like to do at WeedMe in terms of social impact. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Blist is an, yet another brand that we acquired, um, and, and all of these acquisitions came uh, as of late during this opportunistic period of time, as Mohan had mentioned in terms of the multiples that a lot of companies are transacting at and trading at have come down significantly to uh, one or two times revenue or something significantly lower than that in some cases. So we acquired Blist. This is a CBD focused uh, brand uh, for health and wellness. Uh, it's, it's oils and creams and tinctures uh, for people looking to microdose with CBD products to make sure that we cover that product uh, gamut. Let's go to the next slide. It, it really it comes down to the team behind WeedMe. That's the, the success. So uh, I'm, I'm Terry Kulego, the founder and CEO, and Benny Pressman was my co-founder and chief commercial officer. Uh, beyond ourselves and starting this company six years ago, uh, Maur Shait and Jenny Lee Tabiera, our chief operating officer and director of quality assurance, have been with us since day one. Um, the remainder of the people on this slide uh, have also been since the beginning, not since day one, because on day one, <clears throat> it was just the four of us. Um, but these people joined and the culture at WeedMe is really what uh, sets us apart from our, our, our peers. Uh, we set the tone for an inclusive environment to work in where people are comfortable, they feel secure. We stayed open throughout the whole pandemic. Uh, people enjoyed the ability to continue working and it was very unique for us to be able to continue working through the entire pandemic. And as a result, we have a very, very strong team that helps us to not only be very efficient, but to maintain our growth because we're not replacing people. We're just continually adding more new people. Let's go to the next slide. In terms of our growth, um, this is uh, year over year from May 21 until April 2022. Um, we've had the highest growth in terms of brand out of all of our peers. Um, significant brand growth as we continue to evolve our product offerings and innovate our product portfolio. Our performance uh, to date has been based solely on the WeedMe brand. So these other five brands that we're introducing now set the stage for tremendous growth into the following years. Next slide. Here's a chart of our historical revenue growth. Um, Hygrovest's investment uh, into WeedMe predates this chart. We've got Q1 2019 on the left at 1.1 million. Our last quarter, we closed out just shy of $15 million. Uh, prior to that was just shy of 12 and 11 and then eight. Um, it just continues to grow. For us, it's really a, a big growth story as everything we seem to do uh, works very well in the industry and the consumers are, are showing that in terms of the dollar spent on the WeedMe brand and soon to be on the other following brands that we've introduced. Uh, next slide. On this slide, it, it shows a little bit more accurately our calendar year earnings. So 2021, entirely WeedMe branded sales, just shy of $31 million uh, gross sales. Uh, we are EBITDA positive, uh, just shy of $2 million. And we have a, 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 a rather comfortable margin at nearly 30% compared to our peers. It, it's it's a, a business model that's very hard to replicate for others. Um, and again, it goes back to our team that we're able to do that. To demonstrate our growth, <clears throat> I did put in our uh, unaudited figures for the, uh, 2022, the first half of the year. Uh, we've already done 20, uh, $25.6 million in sales, which uh, is very close to our entire previous year. So I expect that this growth is going to continue well into the future and in fact, actually accelerate as more space in the uh, industry opens up with companies that are having difficulty, particularly raising funds in the public market as they uh, run at, uh, at, at a high clip burning money with negative gross margins in a lot of cases. 
Um, we can go to the next slide. I think that concludes, uh, you can go to the last slide. Um, I think that I'll just finish with uh, Mo, you, you brought up a great point in, in terms of the multiples that uh, companies are trading at. It's an incredibly opportunistic time to be supportive of the right companies that have the right business metrics. Uh, we are operating profitably, uh, and this is this really does set us apart uh, in addition to us being able to continually increase our market share. Uh, with that, I think I'll, I'll leave it to uh, Mike and Mo to continue and any questions that you guys may have. I just wanted to provide some highlights uh, from the year just past. Uh, we released our unaudited results in uh, mid-July. We expect to uh, provide audited results by the end of August. In terms of uh, FY22, uh, whilst the year from the board's point of view was disappointing, we did achieve some of the objectives that we established at the start of the year. Uh, we sold uh, at a significant asset being Entourage Notes, it's been mentioned before, and that's contributed uh, to a cash balance uh, with a tax refund of about $7 million. We sold our position in Embark Health. It wasn't a, uh, a good result for us, but we did achieve a liquidity event and we made uh, $2.5 million in non-cannabis investments in the uh, healthcare space, uh, which we think uh, will provide good returns in the next 12 months. In terms of uh, the forthcoming year, we've given the transition that we went through in FY22, we've got a significant investment in Weed Me. You've heard the presentation, it's very positive. It's uh, weed means 40% of our portfolio. So we're well placed to get leverage uh, on that growth that Terry's talked about. Uh, we've got $7 million worth of cash and tax refund that we are seeking to re uh, redeploy over the next 12 months, uh, primarily, uh, as Mohan said, in the non-cannabis sector and in those uh, sector opportunities that uh, he provided uh, a good presentation on. We're, going, we're continuing to focus on the realisation of what we call the legacy assets. Uh, they, uh, some of them are in escrow, some of them are coming out of escrow, some of them are listed, some of them are unlisted. Uh, we're, we're taking, we're being opportunistic. Parallax are working hard because obviously there's an incentive there to realise cash and uh, put it to uh, work in sectors that provide greater prospects. And we're, as I said, we're, we're looking positively on the returns of the non-cannabis investments that we made in FY22. I'll, we'll have another presentation uh, webinar in, in October and we'll provide uh, the opportunity for one of our other investee CEOs to uh, to make a presentation and uh, I just again wanted to thank Terry for taking the time to put together his presentation but also provide an insight into what, what's a terrific story uh, against a backdrop where uh, clearly he's and this is objective because the it's a public market the cannabis space in Canada where he's clearly uh, outperforming the uh, his peers in the listed space thanks very much